MassCom 101, Quick and Dirty, Chapter 13, Media Law. The First Amendment to the Constitution, which is also the first of the Bill of Rights, has five freedoms in it. If we were in class, I would ask class members to come up with the five freedoms. Well, most students individually are unable to do that. Usually the group can. But if you're wondering how to quickly remember the five freedoms in the First Amendment, I have a memory device for you. Think about raspy, like a raspy cough. Uh, except in this case we have a second P at the end, so it's R-A-S-P-P. -P. And from that little memory device, that little monomic device, you can remember that the five freedoms are R, religion, A, assembly, S, speech, P, press, and the other P, petition. This is the entire text of the First Amendment. And I guess I find it sort of surprising for two reasons. The first thing is how brief it is. I mean, the First Amendment really is just one long, run-on sentence. When you think about all the careers and all the court battles and all the term papers and all the books that have been written about just one little sliver of the First Amendment, it's kind of shocking to see how brief it is. The second thing about it that I find kind of remarkable is how sweeping the language is. It's not exactly riddled with exceptions. Congress shall make no law. You wonder, huh, why is Congress involved with this? Well, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were originally just about the federal government. And so if we're talking about laws at the federal level, well, we're talking about Congress. Shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. What that means is there is no official religion of the United States. That said, there are some very fine nations that happen to have an official religion. We're just not one of them. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That is the freedom of religion clause or abridging the right to the freedom of speech or of the press. Now, press has come to mean electronic media, online media, so don't take press too narrowly. Or the right of the people to peaceably assemble. Although I would have to say in the middle of the coronavirus crisis, I guess the right of the people to peaceably assemble has been... Um, suspended for a little while. But during normal times, think about something like the Women's March uh, shortly after uh, Mr. Trump was sworn into office, or marches for, for science and, and so forth, the right of the people to peaceably assemble, and to petition the government for redress of grievances. In California, as in many, but not all other states, we, the voters, have the right to put our signatures on a petition so that we can get proposed laws onto the ballot through the initiative process. Freedom of speech and press. There are some, including some scholars, who believe that there are no significant differences between the First Amendment right to freedom of speech and freedom of press. I have to say, I disagree with that. I, I think that there is a very significant difference between the two. I see freedom of speech as a pure right and freedom of the press as a hybrid right. So let me get a little bit into my thinking. So when I say that freedom of the press is a hybrid right, what I'm saying is 
it is the pure right of freedom of speech as filtered through something else the framers of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were very concerned with, and that was property rights. So, all right, you're saying, well, you know, I can remember that for a test, that freedom of the press is freedom of speech plus property rights, but, you know, what does that really mean? All right, let me give you an example. Here you go. I am publisher, owner of the last newspaper in these parts to be earning a decent profit, the Glendale Daily Eberts. All of you listening to this are my staff. You're my photographers, my reporters, my editors, and so forth. I have just come back from a meeting of my uh, colleagues. We call ourselves the Rich Dudes of Glendale. And we heard about an exciting presentation that would uh, start us on the path toward creating a huge mall called North Americana. And for that to happen, the city would need to use its eminent domain power to seize blighted property at 1500 North Verdugo Road. Why, that's Glendale College. As publisher, I think it's a wonderful idea. It will create a lot more advertisers for the newspaper. So I want to have an impassioned front page editorial tomorrow that says, yes, dear readers, urge your city council members to approve this project and let's get going on North Americana. All of you think the project is just appalling. And you also, uh, you writers and photographers and editors, you also want an impassioned front page editorial tomorrow, but you want it to say, save Glendale College. Well, who has the legal right to dictate the content of tomorrow's editorial? Well, I'm going to defer to uh, mid-20th century essayist A.J. Liebling on this one. Liebling once said famously about freedom of the press, it is for the man who owns one. The John Peter Zanger case was before American independence, before the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, or the First Amendment. Mr. Zanger had apparently uh, said something damaging about the royally appointed governor of New York. It was also apparently true. And in those days, libel was a criminal offense, not civil. You could go to jail for it. Well. Uh, it was shown in court that uh, Mr. Zanger had indeed harmed the reputation of uh, the uh, colonial appointed official, and so therefore he should have been convicted under uh, the law of that time. Well, the jury uh, practiced a, a thing called nullification. They found Zanger not guilty because to them, the jury, it mattered that Zanger's uh, criticism 
was accurate. And so what this trial did was it established truth as a defense against libel. Now, after the revolution, you would think that we would have passed the uh, First Amendment freedom of speech and freedom of press and never looked back. Well, no. No sooner was the ink dry on the Bill of Rights than the Alien and Sedition Act was passed. And I can think of few things that would be uh, more against the spirit of the First Amendment than making it a crime to criticize the government of the United States. Thomas Jefferson, when he uh, assumed office as president, wisely pardoned everyone uh, convicted under this law. In the 20th century, uh, sedition was a crime during times of major wars. Uh, there are limits to the First Amendment, and especially when it is speech that pertains to the war effort. The USA Patriot Act created another layer of limits on the First Amendment. Number 11, 2001 attacks, it allowed greater spying on Americans in the United States. And it did so by widening the definition of what is terrorism and who is a terrorist. Among the folks who were very concerned about the Patriot Act were librarians. And what they were sensitive to was the provision that would allow FBI agents to examine individual media use. There were librarians who had concerns that FBI agents would come into the library one day with a list of names and would want to know what books those people had checked out. I've mentioned that the First Amendment is not absolute, but one place where it is very close to absolute is in regard to prior restraints. A prior restraint is when government, not a threatening lawyer, but government, stops something from being printed or broadcast. This would be government saying, that television show cannot go forward, or we, the government, are saying, stop the presses on that newspaper story. The courts have determined that prior restraints are almost never legally permissible. This extends to even stuff that is obviously libelous. If someone is about to broadcast or write or put on the internet something that is uh, terribly damaging to you and truly uh, a lie, well, probably the best a person could do is to find a big scary lawyer and to send a sternly worded letter or to make an angry phone call and say, we are suing you if this goes out. But what you would not be able to do is to go to a judge and get a court order to stop the communication from happening. The landmark case in this category is Near versus Minnesota. And Frankly, I feel kind of bad for the state of Minnesota because I think they were trying to do the right thing. In the 1920s, Minnesota passed an anti-hate law. This was at a time when the Ku Klux Klan and similar groups were pretty powerful. Mr. Neer was on the streets of Minneapolis passing out viciously anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish pamphlets. The county sheriff, uh, citing the Minnesota law, confiscated Mr. Neer's pamphlets. He felt that his First Amendment speech and press rights had been violated, and so he challenged the Minnesota law. The case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, which eventually ruled in favor of Mr. Neer. It said that Minnesota was engaged in overreach by not allowing uh, Mr. Neer's pamphlets, however noxious, to not see the light of day. The court in the near decision said that 
prior restraints uh, would almost never be legal, but that one exception would be matters relating to our war efforts. And so during the Second World War, dispatches from the battlefield, yes, they were censored, and the Supreme Court was all right with that. The Pentagon Papers case is probably the last major challenge to the notion of prior restraints. This is when the New York Times and later the Washington Post, and after that other newspapers, had a top-secret Defense Department report leaked to them. It was a report about how the U.S. got so deeply mired in what, up until the early 1950s, had been uh, uh, the French's problem, uh, Vietnam, uh, French Indochina. And so the Pentagon Papers were a report about how did this wind up in the laps of the U.S., and how did we get into this civil war deeper and deeper? When the first article written from, these, uh, from this report appeared in the New York Times in June 1971, President Nixon ordered his attorney general to get a court order to stop the Times and then later the Post uh, from publishing articles from the Pentagon Papers. The Supreme Court sprung into action with uncharacteristic speed and, in a split decision, ruled in favor of the newspapers. I think what probably saved the newspapers in this case is that the Pentagon Papers were not about troop strength or weapons capabilities or anything strategic like that. It was pretty much a historic report about political decisions that got us. Let's talk about slander and libel. Slander, which we won't talk about too much uh, in this chapter, is defamatory material that is spoken, and usually in an interpersonal setting. Libel is defamatory material that essentially goes through the media. It's written, it's broadcast, it's put out there for an audience. Now you may wonder if someone in a radio interview says something that is defa defamatory. Is that slander or is that libel? That is generally libel. It's never good to be sued for libel, but now, it is a feature of our civil system that anybody can sue anybody for anything. Sometimes fast food restaurants get sued because the coffee is too hot. But what this slide is about are the four things that are necessary to bring about a credible libel suit, one that could actually win. First, Somebody has to be defamed. I mean, look at that word, and I think you'll understand the meaning. Somebody's good reputation has to be trashed. Two, they have to be identified. They can be identified by name. They can be identified by description. They can be identified by photograph. Third, the material in question has to go out to the audience. It has to be published. It has to be broadcast. It has to go on the web server. You know, there are a lot of hard-hitting stories that circulate around the newsroom and then get pulled at the last minute. It isn't libel until it makes it out to the audience. And then finally, and this goes all the way back to colonial America, the John Peter Zanger decision, it has to be untrue. If you write that uh, the mayor is taking bribes and you have proof, that's not a libel case. That's an award-winning story. Your media organization has been sued for libel. What are the defenses?
the best single defense is the truth. That what you published, what you broadcast, what you put online is true, and you can prove it. Now, as a matter of legal procedure, the person suing has to prove that it is false. But media organizations find that the costs of legally defending against a libel suit are sometimes almost as bad as losing. So if the, org if the media organization can have overwhelming evidence that the story is true, that will typically stop a lawsuit dead in its tracks. Privilege. The First Amendment has come to protect artists, comedians, and others. But what it was originally meant to protect more than anything was robust political discussion. And so for that reason, public officials, all the way from Glendale College trustees to U.S. Senators, are covered by privilege when doing their duty. So in other words, a U.S. Senator in committee hearings can say things that would normally get him sued for libel, but because it is in the pursuit of his job, he is covered by a thing called privilege. Now, are media organizations covered by privilege? Uh, for example, you may have noticed this fellow down here. This is Senator Joseph McCarthy, Republican senator from Wisconsin, 1940s, 1950s. He was the fellow who accused people in the entertainment industry, the State Department, and many other people of being communists or fellow travelers. And Senator McCarthy named names, but he knew to only name names while in his official capacity as a U.S. Senator. If he held a press conference, say, back in Wisconsin, he could have easily gotten sued. Now, you are a reporter, and you are covering the, the senator's uh, hearings or committee meeting, and he is naming names, and it normally would be libelous. Can your newspaper print it? Well, under a concept called conditional privilege, you can. And so you would wonder, well, what's the condition in conditional privilege? It is to get the other side of the story. And if the other side of the story says no comment, put that in the paper. Put that on the broadcast. Fair comment and criticism is what gives reviewers the right to say that a restaurant is terrible or that a play is boring. The landmark case regarding fair comment and criticism uh, concerns the women here in the photo near the top of the screen. The Cherry Sisters. They were a vaudeville act, a live variety act around 1900. And by all accounts, they couldn't sing, they couldn't dance, and if they were funny, it was probably not intentional. In 1899, a small town Iowa newspaper editor wrote a scathing review of their variety act. The sisters sued for libel. Their point was, if we get many more reviews like this, we'll be out of work. The case went to the Iowa Supreme Court, and the story has it that the Iowa justices, before ruling, asked the sisters uh, for a command performance of their act so they would know what they were ruling on. The sisters complied, and the judge uh, ruled in favor of the newspaper editor. But this rather silly decision leaves us with an important First Amendment concept that reviewers, so long as it is opinion and not misstatements of fact, are protected by the First Amendment. Consent is a defense that is not in your book, but I think should be. Sometimes people will sign hold harmless agreements. Imagine folks who are invited onto 
daytime talk shows where you know, the, the, the whole plan of the show is to hold somebody up to ridicule. You know, how do those folks not sue the show? Well, it's because of agreements uh, not to sue that they sign up front. The last defense against a libel suit is that the person suing is a public figure. Now, public figures can win libel suits, but it is harder for them to do so than it is for you or me. The landmark case for public figures and libel is New York Times versus Sullivan. It began in 1961 with an ad in the New York Times by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. That's Martin Luther King's organization. It was a fundraising ad that talked about the violent treatment that Dr. King's Freedom Riders had faced in Montgomery, Alabama just a couple of months before. The ad had some factual inaccuracies. It misstated the title of the police commissioner, called him police chief. They don't use that title in Montgomery. The ad overestimated the number of police dogs that were turned on Dr. King's followers. Well, based upon that, the mayor of Montgomery and the police commissioner sued the New York Times for libel. Please note, not the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. This is that notion of deep pockets. You go after the party with the money. And in the local Alabama court, the New York Times lost. It was a $1.5 million payout, which would be perhaps the equivalent of 15, uh, maybe $20 million today. The New York Times appealed the decision, uh, probably for three reasons. One, a lot of money was at stake. Two, they felt they were right. And third, they probably felt that they could get a better decision if they could simply get the case out of Alabama. The U.S. Supreme Court reviewed the ad and found that it, in fact, did have some factual inaccuracies. But those inaccuracies were rather minor. I remember reading the majority opinion of this case, and one of the lines that struck me was, uh, when you are being pursued by vicious police dogs, you do not stop to count them. The U.S. Supreme Court majority ruled that the ad was substantially correct that the SCLC and New York Times had taken reasonable care in preparing the ad. And so in reversing the payout to the mayor and police commissioner, uh, the, the court majority in 1964 defined a thing called actual malice. For a public figure to win a libel suit, they have to show actual malice, which is publishing or broadcasting something knowing that it is false or with reckless disregard of whether it is true or false. And so what this has done since 1964 is it has made it very difficult for a public figure to win a libel suit. And so oftentimes when someone with some measure of fame or power sues for libel, sometimes the real battle is over whether that person will be considered a public figure or a regular person. Where we were. 